That's a good ball. This isn't now you're on. recordable. Now uh, you're on now. I guess, you know, given the, the sparse attendance, you know, I think it's a fair question as to what do we want to get out of this session, right? Like, there's 50 slides in the deck that I can talk through while you all check your email, which is fine. Um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, maybe we should do something else. You know, we can turn this into a little bit more boffy, conversational, you know, like, what were you expecting to get out of this other than that you, you really enjoy listening to me talk or... <laughs> Um, uh, because I know I do, right? Um, <laughs> um, uh, or you have nowhere else to go, and you figure you probably get the power here. Um, <laughs> so you know, I, we can do the overview of the slides, we can do the overview of assurance, but we can also just kind of like talk out various issues. Um, you know, what do you guys want to do? Well, why don't you take us through the slides, maybe even in an abbreviated form, and it will engender many. some discussion. There's too many to do in a really good form. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm not the common guy at our organization. I was really just here to learn a little bit more about the LOAs and what's being done in terms of projects that are supporting levels of insurance and how they're doing it. So we're talking about things like CAS and Shibboleth doing attribute release and that kind of stuff. I don't really know enough about it to really speak intelligently. Yeah, I mean, we could be. There's not a lot in the slides about that particular aspect of it. Um, that's certainly a topic that could engender some conversation. Uh, so, uh, so we could, I mean, we could cover a fair amount of that overview with select topics, I guess. Um, what about uh, anybody else? You do beat work, so what do you? <laughs> yeah, just okay. hanging out. Just hanging out, I was just curious about it. I hadn't, uh, it was because it was so outside of the, the veil of what I normally cover. That's actually why I do <laughs> So, see, you need to do the slides, Ben. Come uh, on, I'm man. Trying to course me. Come on, man. Actually, what's funny is. No, he has to. This is, probably the, this is probably the deck that I was least able to copy and paste from previous decks, too. So. Yeah, see, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's benefit from all that hard work. All righty, let's see how quickly we can go through this. Uh, <laughs> Oh, wow, there's a lot of slides in here. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, we'll speed talk to some of them. Um, uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll... Uh, somebody, Aaron's taller than I am. Um, so you haven't missed much, our <laughs> late joiners. Uh, we've just been pondering what to do with this session, and, and the consensus seems to be to do a quick run through the slides and perhaps uh, have some conversation after that. A quick run will be a bit of a challenge because of the sheer quantity of the slides. Um, How fast can you click? I can click pretty <laughs> fast. Um, so uh, actually, I think I can click faster than LibreOffice can render the next you're, slide. You're already 14 minutes into a 45-minute session, too, Ben. Oh, my clock is three and a half. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's talk a little bit about identity insurance. Uh, so basically, identity assurance is risk assessment for electronic authentication. Uh, how confident you are that the person authenticating is the person you think they are. Uh, and there's a lot of business process and, and uh, you know, uh, agreements that need to happen and, and assessment of uh, practices, et cetera, around that. But basically, the idea is to align the quality of the credentials with the data that you're accessing and protecting. Now, you know, in higher ed, this could be different types of things. We were talking email. Who cares about email? Well, unless you've got uh, HIPAA-protected data going through it. Maybe you shouldn't be using email for that. Um, but, you know, we could be talking student records or HR records, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the idea behind identity assurance is to come up with some common criteria for identity providers and service providers to make this sort of decision or this, uh, for, for risk assessment and authentication a bit easier. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, reference material here. Uh, so uh, in theory, this presentation is mostly about the common identity assurance profiles, which are now on version 1.2. Uh, but there are other, there's three other things going on here. Uh, the in common profiles are uh, certified to uh, what we're called the FICAM Trust Framework Provider uh, Assurance. I actually forgot what the ADP stand for. But basically, it's a framework for saying these are the entities that are making um, assurance uh, uh, 
that are <laughs> generating assurance levels uh, based on some reference standard. The reference standard generally being the NIST uh, special publication 863 and its variants, which in turn are uh, derived out of the Office of Management and Budget M0404, which dates all the way back to the Bush administration, that would be the second Bush administration. Um, basically, the OMB document provides sort of uh, risk assessments and says here are four levels of risk that you're willing to, that you may be willing to consider, and actually the next slide will talk a little bit about that. Um, the NIST documents are technical implementations, or one version of technical implementation to reach, uh, to uh, address that risk assessment. Um, the incumbent IAPs are another um, uh, technical implementation to reach that assessment. Um, and then the, the FICAM operation is basically a certifying thing saying, well, if you certify to the IAPs from incumbent, that's sort of the same thing certifying to the, uh, the NISP documents. Uh, it's, this is kind of a maybe a brief, simple version of it. And I realize I'm not doing a good job of just going through the slides. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, just so you know, when we talk about incumbent versus versus the NIST special publication, versus the OMB document, or versus FICAM. Um, there's a relationship between all of these. It's not exactly the most intuitive thing. Um, the OMB levels of authentication discuss the various risks that, uh, that you might be willing to accept, and basically categorizes them into four levels. Um, so things about confidence in the validity of the identity, risk of liability from a, from a you know, from a compromised authentication event, risk of release of sensitive data, or risk to personal safety. And so as you can see, there's a scale here that says on level one, you know, for example, a compromise has no risk to personal safety. So somebody compromises my bookmarks, you know, it's probably not going to be a, a major issue. Um, so in common bronze is comparable with level one, in common silver is comparable with level two. Uh, presumably at some point there will be gold and platinum common profiles, but those don't exist. And at the moment, we're not even at the point where we're deploying bronze and silver widely yet. Um, some correlating use cases, uh, you know, level one is really, the level is retrieving bookmarks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, assigning grades or updating financial info might be a level two kind of thing. Uh, the level three example is submitting a patent application, which is I'm not sure something that we would be doing in higher well, I guess maybe some of the, the faculty and researchers might be. Um, and then level four is something like access to health records or law enforcement databases. Uh, again, these are just examples. You can imagine a fair amount of flexibility in, and how you might interpret various levels of risk um, to, the, to the levels of authentication you might require. Uh, a little bit on the e-authentication model, just to get some terminology out of the way. Uh, this is really slowing down the slides. Um, uh, so we have an applicant who applies to a registration authority. Within your university, a lot of these may be played by the same you know, department. So a lot of this uh, registration authority, in this case, might be your HR system when a person gets hired. Or it might be you set up a separate process within your identity management system that's independent of your onboarding. Um, uh, the registration authority vets and approves an applicant, becomes a subscriber of a credential service uh, provider. So a credential service provider is probably going to be your identity management system. You get issued a token and some credentials, and uh, you may go through some identity proofing, uh, which is might involve looking at a uh, driver's license or something along those lines. Um, I should have mentioned this before, but obviously all those are US standards from the previous slide. Um, there are other initiatives going on in a few other countries um, at this point uh, that are intended to be comparable, but of course they're not identical. Um, that will probably need to get resolved at some point, but we're still in the early days of, of the internationalization of assurance levels. Uh, in any event, um, so uh, identity proofing, again, may be done by your, your, your system of record, like your HR system, or it may be done by your, uh, uh, by your IDMS, varying workflows for this according to what works uh, for, for campus. Um, when a subscriber accesses a service, they become a claimant accessing uh, a service provided by a relying party, um, and their identity is authenticated by verifier. So claimant is really the human, the relying party is the application they're trying to access, and the verifier is probably your authentication service run by your identity manager. Um, a little bit uh, out of context, but here, well, in context, except jumping frameworks, this is the in common the authentication model, which sort of is pretty much the same thing, just in pictures. Um, the previous slides were the, the um, uh, OMB authentication model, I think. 
Um, but it's sort of the same thing here. In this example, you see the IDMS operations um, uh, providing attributes and authentication and being the verifier. The registration authority is the scenario of the IDP operator um, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of detail on these in the next slides, which I'll mostly just gloss over. Um, if you're interested, this talks about the different technical requirements at each of, for the various aspects of identity assurance at the various levels. And they come from 863, the NIST document. Um, so for example, for registration at level one, you can be anonymous. There's no verification. At level two, there is some verification, which can be a government ID in person, or you can do some remote trickery using government IDs and, and financial account numbers. Um, and then uh, level three, you actually need to do verification. So if somebody shows up and gives you a driver's license, you need to you need to query a database to verify that that's a valid driver's license, not just look at it and say, yeah, it kind of looks okay. Um, uh, and then uh, level four, you can't do remote registration anymore, and there's actually a biometric uh, requirement that you can play. Um, going through some of the others, uh, you know, tokens, there's a similar progression <laughs> from where you know, passwords are acceptable up to the point at level four where you have to be talking you know, FIP certified hardware tokens um, uh, along with your biometrics. Um, the details of this are again in, the, in this document, so you can, if you're curious and want to go you know, into the glory uh, underpinnings of this stuff, you can read through those documents. Um, token credential management, you know, level one is pretty simple. You can have you know, hashed passwords. Um, all the way up through uh, um, level four, which imposes things like a 24-hour uh, revocation period and record retention for 10 and a half years after the, after the credentials have expired. Some of this stuff may actually have changed a little bit. Uh, I think these slides are based on one of the earlier drafts, but uh, so just take some of this with a grain of salt. So, yeah. Are there any uh, limitations on the lifetime of these levels of assurance based on the presented credentials? Um, there can be with the tokens, and we'll get back to that in, a, in probably 20 or 30 slides. Um, not at level one and two? Uh, well, no, definitely level one and level two. And that's actually one of the big areas of discussion we're having now on the assurance um, uh, implementers calls, um, is that at level one and level two, if you're using passwords, the passwords have to meet certain criteria for, um, for likelihood of being compromised. And that, in turn, implies things like effective lifetimes of those credentials. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And probably at level one and level two, if you do it, if you if you do if you certify in certain ways, there's probably not strictly speaking expiration periods attached to anything. So for example, a registration record, you know, level one doesn't even have it, so it can't expire. Um, uh, the creden the the tokens themselves may or may not need to expire depending on how you uh, set up your, your Compliance. Uh, we'll come back to that in, in a minute or two. Uh, the authentication process, uh, we'll skip over a little bit because largely we're going to say make sure you're using TLS, which I think is something we all know now. Um, uh, so we'll just jump past that. Um, and then uh, assertions again, if you're using standard kind of things um, uh, like you know, SAML or CAS, uh, SHIP or CAS, uh, you'll be compliant here most of the way uh, up the tree. Um, so the Incumbent Identity Assurance Profiles are, as mentioned, a specific implementation that's tailored uh, towards the higher ed um, uh, community. Um, I think probably most people in here are familiar, but Incumbent is a federation of 300 plus and growing higher ed institutions and a couple hundred non-higher ed institutions, so government nonprofits, uh, etc. Um, and the idea is to use federated credentials to facilitate authentication to share resources. The IAPs were, um, the in common IAPs were approved by the US government, i.e. FICAM, for access to federal services at uh, level one and level two, i.e. if you are an identity provider, you can use the in common IAPs to certify to LOA one and two. As of now, Virginia Tech is the only hired institution uh, that has done so. Um, and if you go to the uh, FICAM list of certified um, uh, authentication services, uh, you will see Virginia Tech listed there alongside Google, PayPal, Verisign, and all these others. Um, those three are actually certified only for LOA1 at the moment and only via OpenID. 
Um, there's actually just recently I noticed a bunch of LOA4 um, authorities showed up, including uh, Citibank. So uh, that's relatively new. We won't see any LOA4 in higher ed for a while, I think. Um, uh, and, uh, and now, actually, the, the common IAPs are useful for high performance computing. Uh, the International Grid Trust Federation has approved their use. Um, if that's a use case you need to worry about. Um, so basically, the goal at the moment for bronze and silver, though, is you know we're we're still going to be using passwords for a while. Um, let's make them better, um, uh, and eventually we'll be able to move beyond them. Uh, but for now, you know, it's what we got. Um, compliance is via the Assurance Advisory Committee. Um, bronze is basically self-asserted. Uh, the audit requirement for bronze was dropped. Um, silver requires an audit uh, that you provide. Um, to the advisory uh, I'm going to skip the next picture and jump straight into uh, the factors that go into compliance. Um, so there's business policy and operational factors. Which, you know, I'm not going to read the list because there's one slide for each of these, so we'll just kind of jump through them. But there's eight of these um, uh, factors at a high level that go into uh, compliance. So for example, business policy and operational include things like being a good standing in common. Um, and agreeing that you'll notify in common if there are any substantial changes um, to your compliance, uh, and recertification required every three years. Um, there's a little bit more detail that I'm kind of glossing over in the slides here. Uh, again, you can read the in common insurance profiles on your flight home. Um, you'll probably finish them. Actually, they're not that long. Uh, the, so uh, the next section is on registry and identity proofing. Uh, this is generally a silver only thing because as previously mentioned, bronze doesn't have any registration requirements. Uh, at silver, you need to record names, dates of birth, address of record, um, uh, the document you used for identity proofing, and any termination or revocation credentials. Address of record can be an email address. It can be an actual physical address. Um, it can be a phone number if you want to be doing SMS. Uh, for password reset type operations. Uh, and, if, and, and the fun bit here is after you expire a credential, you still need to retain records about that credential for seven and a half years, uh, which is possibly something you're doing now if you never turn off, you know, if you never delete anything, or possibly you're something you're not doing now if you just delete everything all the time. Uh, there are facilities for remote proofing, but it'll be interesting to see if anybody goes down this path of trying to um, uh, adhere to them as described in the profiles uh, because you can imagine the pushback you'll get when you start asking for driver's license numbers, passport numbers, and bank account numbers uh, in order to issue credentials to a contractor or to a remote student. Um, that's probably not going to fly for a lot of people. Uh, there's a fair amount of discussion about what to do about that instead, um, and there's some thoughts about doing things like uh, using movies, or you know, if you've got multiple campuses around the world, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, uh, but uh, you're still you know, not quite uh, a firm understanding of, of how to handle this. Uh, and both bronze and silver require that you know, protection of personally identifiable information, so policies and procedures in place to prevent people from you know, copying and pasting screen slapshots about uh, uh, students and you know, emailing them or posting a slash shot. Um, credential technology is the next section. Uh, these are things that I think probably intuitively make sense anyway. You know, credential must map to one person, uh, for example. Uh, we'll get to the topic on credentials being resistant to guessing, which is the same thing we were just mentioning before about, you know, about uh, tokens expiring. Um, credentials can't be stored in plain text, which hopefully at this point is something that's a little, you know, a little intuitive to us. Um, uh, and there's a little bit of a stronger requirement for silver about some protections that need to be taken, but we'll skip that. Um, additionally, there's a statement about when your applications touch passwords, how do you handle that? So it doesn't say you can't have something that wants to find LDAP rather than use your web SSO, but it does say that you need to have policies and procedures in place to minimize the risk. So there's a vetting of the application or, or something along those lines. Onto credential issuance and management. Uh, uh, compromised credentials need to be revoked within 72 hours, and there are a variety of means by which a, a, a credential can be renewed. If it's a non expired valid credential, you can just type your old password, select a new password kind of thing. 
Um, you can reset via a single-use token. So if you have that address of record from an earlier step, you can set a single-use token to it, which can be used to set a password. If you've collected previously registered personal questions, you know, what was your mother's maiden name plus the color of the dress she wore last Thursday, uh, that might be sufficient to uh, renew credentials, um, as long as they're not too easy to guess. Um, and failing all that, you start over and go show your driver's license again and get a new credential. And again, your records need to be retained for seven and a half years. Uh, the section on authentication process can be best summarized as don't be in the dark ages. Uh, if you're using SSL type uh, protocols and their equivalents, then you're probably okay there. Uh, there's also a section on identity information management that reduces down to you need to be uh, tracking what are called identity assurance qualifiers. These are basically the strings that get asserted saying this person is bronze, this person is silver. Um, on a per subject basis, if you're not going to make everybody compliant. And probably in most scenarios, um, you'll be dealing with per subject rather than the entire population of 10,000 people are either all compliant or not compliant. Uh, a few more kind of uh, almost self-evident things on assertion content, for example, uh, you can only assert IAQs for those who are eligible, and you can only do it in a cryptographically secure manner, so sign assertion or something like this. Um, there is a section, uh, perhaps one of the more entertaining ones, in terms of potential impact, depending on your relationship with your network admins and system admins, on the technical environment, uh, which is only applies to silver, uh, but basically says at a very broad level, you need to actually have a shop that is maintaining things. So, software is up to date on patches. You don't have the ability for just anybody to walk into the machine room, uh, et cetera. Um, there's not a lot of very specific advice here. You know, Not that you need to be using smart cards with biometric authentication in the machine room so much as you need to be doing reasonable things. And if your auditor is happy with it, then probably the committee would be happy with it as well. New recently is this concept of alternative means, which is basically the idea that you may want to try to do something that makes sense, but that is not explicitly permitted in the in the IAPs. And so there's now a mechanism for submitting alternate means um, to address a particular aspect of the IAPs in a way that may not have originally been thought of. So. Alternative means can be proposed either before an application or along with it, or by community experts um, uh, who come up with a reasonable alternative means, uh, um, sort of independent of an application. Once they are approved, they become normative, and anybody can use them. Uh, this is a theme that's uh, also being looked at, for example, in Active Directory uh, compliance uh, with technical issues that are shaken out. And actually, on that note, we can talk about a few of the challenges that are starting to emerge. Um, so registration procedures, uh, i.e., how are you collecting the information to uh, comply with the silver registration requirements? Um, password policy compliance, this is, uh, again, we'll actually talk about in all of these in a little bit more detail, so rather than inventory them now, let me just say, this is a sampling not intended to be particularly uh, comprehensive in one way or another, or to say anything in particular about you know, how easy or difficult it is to comply, uh, so much as uh, to say on um, the discussions that are happening on the list of phone calls, um, there are certain themes that different campuses are running into. So um, for example, on registration procedures, uh, registration might start at your systems of record, but if you don't have a particularly good relationship with your systems of record, you might start registration at your identity management system. That in uh, the former implies a way to link records, so uh, passing pins around or something along those lines. The latter uh, runs into a tricky situation for bronze, where if a person forgets their password and you can't reset it in any way, shape, or form, you almost lose the ability to uh, relink them to their identity, depending on how you set things up. Um, in silver, this isn't really a problem because one way or another, you need to be doing something like verifying it. You could do something similar with bronze level as well. There's no reason you can't go beyond what the, what the IAPs require. Uh, we talked a little bit already about the remote registration issues. You know, who's going to want to touch these government and financial IDs? 
Uh, so there's some thoughts about doing things like federated registration. Perhaps you can go walk onto somebody else's campus. Um, within your own campus, you might have concepts like campus deputies, especially if you have a large campus. Rather than trekking all the way over to the help desk, perhaps you can just go to your department administrator who's three doors down. Uh, something about notaries, but you know, maybe that's a little bit harder if you're outside of the U.S. for a U.S. compliance. Um, there's a proposal for maybe high definition video conference would be good enough. You can hold up your ID card and smile. Um, although some initial feedback from auditors is that it may not actually be sufficient. Um, the issue, the, the thing here is with only one school having gone through certification, we don't really know how some of these issues play out. So we're still very much early on in determining what will or will not be sufficient. In the area of password policy compliance, um, there's a formula for determining the maximum number of, pass of, of permitted valid authentications uh, before you have to invalidate your credential, um, where silver is the same except for the number that you end up with as bronze. Um, you can bypass this entirely by going to non-password uh, authentication, but assuming that's not reasonable for one reason or another, um, you start to worry about things like password entropy, which is uh, basically a calculation based on how long the password is, whether or not you're doing dictionary checks, and uh, whether or not you have composition rules, which are things like you need to have an uppercase character, you need to have a number, you need to have a special character, etc. Once you, there's a, a mechanism for figuring out this, uh, the entropy given those various requirements um, in the uh, 863 document, and there have been various attempts to pull together applications and spreadsheets that you can just kind of tweak to plug in various parameters and see how the, what your policy is that shakes out. Uh, but largely they result in something along the form of X failed authentication, results in a live minute lockout, and you have to expire your passwords every you know, Z days. So something like 15 failed attempts at bronze gets you a 10 minute lockout, and every year you have to change your password. And silver, you get a two hour lockout instead of a 10 minute lockout. As you can imagine with all these parameters, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, variation you can get in these policies. Um, some credential stores support this natively, some don't. Um, so whether or not this makes sense is a combination of what policies are acceptable on your campus along with what technologies are you using to manage your credentials. Um, we've been discussing option two here, which is, well, why don't you just simply count when you hit the maximum number expire the credential. Um, <coughs> and the nice side effect of this is if you're actually counting failed attempts, you might notice things like a, you know, an attack in progress or a misconfigured down client, and you might be able to proactively do something about it. Um, so we've started floating an idea for a failed authentication counter proposal, which is a horrible name. Um, probably shouldn't be successful failed authentication counter proposal, but that's even worse. Um, uh, we're, we're not very good at naming things. Uh, but basically the idea is uh, in this particular variation, and, and we're starting to discuss uh, additional uh, uh, variations here, but the idea is the credential stores report out their failed authentication events to an accumulator. Uh, in this scenario, we're thinking syslog is the common theme across all of the credential stores. Um, it doesn't need to be syslog, it just seems like a logical starting point because of that. Uh, the syslog accumulator does some filtering and pushes some records into a database. Uh, and actually, our syslog seems to be a reasonable open source product that can take that responsibility on. Uh, and then there's this monitor thing that checks the database periodically and says, um, oh, well, this person is at their threshold. Let me go do something about it. Uh, not, uh, that monitor thing is vaporware at the moment. Uh, probably need to do some development there. Um, we can imagine interacting with your, your existing infrastructure, so your credential management solutions, or uh, to, to actually expire the, uh, the, the password. Uh, you can integrate it with your web SSO, so when someone logs in, they get a message, uh, you've got a 1,000 failed authentication attempts. You should call the service desk or you know, whatever variation of this that you want. Um, so we've had some conversations around this, and it uh, seems to be getting a little bit of traction. Um, if this is something you're interested in, we should actually probably talk about that uh, or join the assurance list. Does the counter ever get reset with a successful, or does it um, continue to go up? On a password change. It goes up otherwise. So even if you have a successful authentication, it stays where it was until you change your password. Um, so uh, so that's that. Um, the third option previously mentioned is you could also just go 
go down the path of tokenness of some form or other uh, and avoid password policies entirely. But then you have to deal with the token management across your campus. Uh, I am not an EV expert. I won't pretend to be. Uh, there are some issues that are shaking out. Um, for example, the use of MD4 is making it tricky to be compliant. Uh, there are a number of AD, uh, um, AD admins and others who are working on this now. Uh, a cookbook was developed, uh, but now there's a little bit more than that, uh, of potentially resulting in some alternative means being proposed to facilitate compliance for AD infrastructure. Um, a note on the assertion of the IAQs, the IAQs actually get asserted in a SAML2 authn context. They're not asserted as an attribute in uh, the normal attribute payload. Uh, they basically just look like those two URLs on the top, um, but uh, uh, there is sort of a, a detail around how to get expressed that needs to be uh, considered. Uh, there's a fair amount of discussion of this um, in, in the list archives, etc. Um, I won't go into too much more detail here. I'll leave to say this is something to be aware of. Uh, one of the other issues that sort of made compliance a little bit tricky is the evolving standards. So the 1.0 IAPs were released back in 2009. Um, two years later, they were simplified dramatically to 1.1. And then just this year, we have the 1.2 FICAM approved versions. Uh, this has made compliance a little bit of a moving target. Um, while in many cases it's also made it easier, um, it does mean it's been a little bit of a challenge to align while the IAPs are describing what you're trying to align them to. Um, similarly, the alternative means are very much in the early stage right now, and those in turn may make compliance significantly easier uh, down the road, especially for, for AD um, uh, and some other things. At the moment, Virginia Tech is the, the only certified campus to be in common profiles. Um, and as a result, there's not a lot of what we might call case law to, to say what is or is not going to be considered compliant. So we're, we're still very much in the early adopter um, uh, phases. There are certainly lots and lots of schools looking at this. And I think you know, short to medium term future, we'll see an evolution from you know, it's just Virginia Tech to it's Virginia Tech and a whole lot of other schools. Um, but in, in the meantime, there's still going to be a number of questions as we try to figure out what exactly will pass for compliance and, and what will not. Um, that said, uh, you know, there's still a business case to be made here. Compliance indicates a lower risk of compromised credentials. Um, using community standards can drive improvements even just within your own campus. So you might get more traction by saying, we need to be compliant with this silver thing over here than saying, our really smart system thinks it's ludicrous that you're still sending passwords over plain text. Um, external references may help in that kind of conversation. Certain research uh, entities are expressing more and more interest in accepting IAQs. CI Logon will now uh, accept IAQs to enable enhanced access to Open Science Grid, for example. Um, and various federal apps are now at LO1. LOA1. Uh, at this point, though, it doesn't mean you need a university LOA1 um, credential to get into them, uh, so much as the federal apps are, are preparing to get to that point. That's pretty much it for the deck. We're strangely back on time. Um, here's some links. Uh, most of the stuff you can get to eventually via the assurance site. There's a, the implementer's wiki down below as a, a, a shortcut. Um, the monthly implementers calls are fun conversations around the leading edge of this stuff. If you're thinking of uh, attempting to achieve compliance in the near future, you should probably be on those calls or delegate somebody to be on them. Uh, the most recent one actually just happened today, so the next one will happen either July 3rd or probably July 10th, depending on whether or not there's a sense that too many people will be away for the, for the US holiday. Uh, and of course, the discussion list. Uh, if you don't, if you get enough email, you can subscribe to this one. It won't measurably change the amount of email you get, uh, but a lot of again, the bleeding edge conversations are happening there. Um, that's it for the slide deck. Sorry, it took me longer to go through them than I promised. Um, we do have a couple minutes left if there's some questions or conversations that folks are interested in. Yeah, I got a question. So. 
it's been a while, but I read the uh, income and website, and it talked about an auditor being outside the IT department to go through and audit all the processes and procedures on campus. Um, so, what kind of person do we need to find to do that? What kind of skill set, and how long should this whole process take? Uh, well, for bronze, you don't need to do that. For silver, uh, you do need to do that. I believe you can use in-house auditors as long as they're not the IT auditor. Right. So if you've got a university audit of department. Um, and uh, what were the other parts of that question? About how long did it how take long? Virginia Tech, for example, to get through this whole process from start to finish? I actually don't know the answer to that offhand. I don't know if anybody else knows. Um, probably two years, but we were working on that before we do it in physics. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's handy. Or I stole my <laughs> Well, actually, since we have a couple minutes, do you want to talk a little bit more broadly about your experience going through? I'm more the inward-facing guy than the outward-facing guy, as far as this is concerned. You probably want to talk to Aaron Where group? I work with uh, identity management group for six years. Um, I work with okay. You know, details I can probably tell you about, but um, actually for our compliance, I can tell. Okay. And Mary does, by the way, join the assurance calls pretty regularly, so if folks are interested, she's pretty responsive, I think, either on the list or on the calls. Um, anything else? Let me wrap this one up. All right, well, thank you all. See if I'll get to deliver those slides, Ben.